Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Today on the podcast, I've got my good buddy, Ryan LeCure, and we are all talking about meathead stuff of hypertrophy, exercise, and uh, just generally uh, catching up with him. I uh, saw him in Austin this past December, uh, which was awesome. Always have a good time uh, together. And I think you'll learn some really cool stuff from him. He's probably not a guy you've heard of. He likes to be kind of hidden away, but he's been competing in natural bodybuilding for many years. And he's very good at doing lat spreads and does a really good job of coaching people also. So super intelligent guy. And I wanted to get him on the show and just chat with him and also catch up. So you'll notice when it starts, like most of these uh, as of late, it's just more of a, a conversation that's pretty wide ranging, but good topics and think stuff you, you will enjoy. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by the Flex Diet Cert. Speaking of stuff you may enjoy, uh, it is eight interventions to help you with nutrition and recovery, or if you're a coach, teach you how to apply this to your clients in a complete done for you, but yet flexible system. So go to flexdiet.com. For all of the information, and you can get on the wait list for the next time that it opens, go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com for all the details. That will put you on the daily free newsletter also. And as of this recording, this podcast will be out this coming Monday. Uh, You probably saw on social media and through the newsletter that I am still quarantined in Costa Rica. (laughs) Uh, So we had a really good time down here. Jody and I were down here and we did some filming for an upcoming documentary on post-traumatic growth. So I did uh, five hours of interviews uh, for that through some friends, which will be awesome. We'll have a lot more information about that coming out. I think it's going to be amazing. So stay tuned for that. Uh, We did some uh, daime or ayahuasca and also combo in the jungle, which was great. You can find my podcast uh, last year when I did something similar and everything went really good. I don't know. I may have more details in the future on that. I might not. haven't decided yet. And then we went to leave. I tested positive on an antigen test at the airport and Jody tested negative. Everyone else in our group tested negative. I wasn't sure had a little bit of a weird cough, but other than that, I felt fine. And I told Jody to leave because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I tried to go back and get another antigen test, figuring, hey, if this next test is negative, then the first one was surely a false positive. I don't have symptoms. I could still make our flight. Well, it turns out you can't do any other testing. So I was not able to do any other testing. I was not able to do a PCR test. I was banned at the airport from doing any other testing. And, uh, yeah, so I'm on an automatic quarantine for 11 days, which I guess could have been 14 days to my hotel room. But then I asked them, I said, well, can I go out and get food? They said, oh yeah, you can go get food. Like, could I go for a walk? Like, oh, that's okay. So, uh, I asked then, can I go to Nicaragua? (laughs) They're like, no. (laughs) So... I'm still not 100% sure what I can and cannot do, but I basically stayed holed up in my hotel room, not to put anyone else uh, at risk or get some huge fine or anything like that. The whole irony of the thing is I was finally able to get a PCR test. Uh, I paid out of pocket, was quite tricky to get, and it was negative. So I'm quarantined here in Costa Rica for COVID, but by a PCR test, I don't have COVID. I'm almost kind of wishing maybe at some point I did and I could just kind of get that part over with. But um, but good to be feeling healthy. Everything else is fine. Much worse places to be trapped. So that's the update on that. And enjoy the podcast today with my good buddy, Ryan LeCure. Not yeah. do, how long do you program together? clients out? This is something I've always debated with myself. Usually four weeks is, okay. is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Unless I have like weird phases that are, that are shorter. Um, I'll do like, I I do have these kind of like pivot weeks on, on, uh, on the back burner at all times. So I had, I did that with a few people, whereas like, I didn't really, I wasn't really ready to write a whole new block of training for them because we hadn't really communicated, especially for the month of December. So I was like, okay, I'll just give you two weeks of 
like we'll do um, like eight by eights for, for like on four different days. And then do like a, I, I put in like a sensory motor type of week, which is more like triplanar type of stuff, just stuff that they normally don't do in the gym. So I'm like, Hey, this is, you're probably not going to get to the gym much this week anyway. So here's, here's this, this workout. It's, it's like, they're, they're pretty quick that you'll feel good. They're more aerobic in nature. You get some different movements in. Um, so that's actually been really helpful. So I can kind of have those on the back burner for when I, um, cause I don't like to just program endlessly for people if I haven't communicated with them. Um, right. but then if I have, then I find that I can usually get away with like four week blocks of training. What, what are you, are you usually doing more, more frequent changes and everything to your programming? I've been trying to get it where I can program in theory four to six weeks ahead of time, but in reality, does that ever really happen? Very few, <laughs> Okay, you know, because so what, what would change that? Well, for the good or bad, like I, I still probably allow people to do stuff a little bit too much custom, but it highly depends upon the person, right? So they'll, something will happen and, you know, just life stuff happens to clients. So it's like, oh, I missed like three days this past week. And so I'm like, oh shit, well, you probably shouldn't go up to four sets next, next week. So let's yeah, yeah. program that down a little bit, or let's move this around. <clears throat> but I think the downside of that is nobody does it consciously, but unconsciously they know that I'll adapt a program to them, which is what I would want to do versus them figuring out a way to get it done. But that's also a double-edged sword too, because I've had people just smoke themselves in the past about getting their you know mandatory four sets in and then week two weeks after that they're just a complete shit show because yeah. they force themselves through it so i think they're making the right decision but i don't know it's like i always feel like i'm trying to adapt the programming to their lifestyle which i think is ideal but then you wonder well, am I just making it too easy for them to do that? Should they be more autonomous? Should they mm. be able to figure it out on their own? And the reality is it's, it's relatively usually small changes too, you know? So I figure that's just like their, their kind of their periodization is, you yeah. know, life kind of periodizes it for them. Most people I change exercises every four to maybe seven weeks, you know, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And I've been getting better at asking people like, Hey, I know you had two weeks off for the holidays. Like I did this with Tommy, you know, I know you had like two weeks off for the holidays. You got some sessions in, you were gone. You're in, you know, friggin' Iceland and shit. Um, do you mind if we rerun like three weeks of the last program or are you so bored silly of that? You never want to look at it again. And if so, we'll retool it and just kind of, you know, motor on to the next one. But I know you've got some travel coming up. I know you've got other things, you know, kind of going, going on. So like, what is kind of the happy medium? So I've been getting better about just, fucking asking clients and he's like no man that's cool like i felt like i was doing good on the last program i want to repeat you know some of those exercises to do a little better i'm like oh okay great in my head i'm thinking oh man he probably doesn't want to do the same thing again but i realize that's my bias because i wouldn't want to do the same thing again. <laughs> mm -hmm. or you just feel like i, I feel like i do that a lot because i'm like trying to justify me being a coach and like i have to be yeah. doing something like right but, but yeah a lot of times you do when you do ask i did the same thing like you, you, they'll be like no, no. Like I'm, I'm good. I actually like, it's actually harder for me to have to do all this. I just started to figure this out. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is cool. Yeah. yeah which, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. No, just, which I guess him. probably just gets into our podcast since these are just chats anyway, we record. So what the hell? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I'm totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in the past I probably changed stuff too often based on my own insecurities and nothing else. Right. Cause to me, I was like, Oh my God, this person's paying me so much money. Like why would I have them do a progression of the same thing again? They're going to think I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm doing and I need to tweak this and I need to prove to them that I know my shit. And the reality was I, I think it cost people results, right? Cause I think I was too quick to change stuff, not based on their physiology, not based on them, not, you know, plateauing on a result or their HRV tanking, or it wasn't based on anything. It was based on my own insecurity of they're going to think I'm an idiot if I don't change stuff. hundred, hundred percent. Yeah. That's, that's, I was so that way, especially when I first started training as a personal trainer at 18. And that was, there was very much, there was 
a lot of that in the culture at my gym of like, you know, oh, he's doing the same workout that he did with his other client, you know, right. He already <laughs> did bench press it. He's been on that bench press all day, you know, or, or whatever. And, and, uh, I remember going through progressions with people planning out their, their workouts and, and just running out of progressions, uh, uh just, uh, what's the next hip hinge. Right. I don't know. Like, and then I'm just making up exercise at some point. <laughs> and, and it took me a, a while to figure out. It took me like having a, a few clients that I had for a few years where it's like, I literally have no more ideas left. Like, I can't come up with any more stupid ass exercises. So I'm going to have to just rerun things at some point. And then eventually you just start dropping off these exercises and realize there, there's, there's so much variation within the, the loading schemes and the rep ranges the time rest periods that you can keep people interested. And I think you're actually giving them a better physiological result. You, you can't, uh, the, the coolest thing for me was finding, you know, anytime you can find research that backs your bias and that's always fantastic. Oh, right. Of course. Um, yeah. You know, so we love that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was kind of the cool thing for me. And a lot of that, the research from, from Dama's, I think is like the first paper that I read from him was in, in 2016 on some of the, uh, muscle protein synthesis responses to, to training and seeing that there's these huge elevations in, in muscle protein synthesis uh, following a, a novel training program, but not necessarily a whole lot of changes in, in hypertrophy. And we kind of already knew that a lot of the changes that take place in the beginning of a training program are, are neurological in nature. Like you're learning how to do the exercise. You're getting stronger because of that. You're getting more synchronous muscular contractions and everything's just getting better on the neurological level. And it isn't really until weeks later that you actually start putting on muscle, but it kind of re even confirmed that uh, further. And, you know, I don't know if that research has been refuted in any way at this point, if there's any additions to that, I mean, I've kind of kept up with it a little bit, but I think the concept is pretty sound in that you, you do see it. And if you're just changing things too often, there's never really a chance to, to get good enough to actually see some real physiological changes. So that, that for me was when I started looking into that stuff and understanding that a little bit more, it, it really justified uh, this concept of keeping things similar enough to get better. And that is better coaching. It just doesn't yeah. feel like it because we're, we're changing other things, we're, we're, but primarily what we're supposed to be changing is physiology, we're not supposed to be changing a spreadsheet. So right. <laughs> I think that that's not what they're paying you for. So so yeah, I think that the concept is huge, huge for coaches. I know that was really, really important for me. And, and, uh, and, and it does make my life easier for sure. Uh, there's, so there is a bias there. I, I did want that to be the case, right? <laughs> um, but I was also willing, like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a hardworking person probably to, to a fault. Like, I think I will always kind of err in that direction, but, um, knowing that it just, I think has made me a lot better, a better coach, a more effective coach. Yeah. The other thing that helped me out too, was I realized I'm like, Oh, especially early on with some of the clients I had, you know, probably eight, 10 years ago left to their own devices. Like, what did they do? I don't know. Whatever flex magazine said this week or this yeah, online yeah. site or that online site. And one of the questions I would ask him is like, okay, a dedicated program. How long did you do it? I would say the average was like, if they were honest and they probably lied to me two to four weeks, yeah. You know, so I'm like, okay, so maybe by having some level of consistency, I'm actually helping them because the extreme novelty they were doing before didn't seem to, to get them to where they wanted to go. And then the other part I realized is I, when I switched to doing like online software, I was like, man, you know, maybe I should create some template. And I had a bunch of coaches and business people like, no, nah, man, you just need to template everything and don't custom stuff. What are you doing? You idiot you're spending hours writing these programs for these people and i had one person just flat out tell me he's like just come up with three templates put people on it they'll never effing know what's going on and <laughs> this is someone who legitimately did this with like 75 people but then advertised it as you know That's completely custom. customized coaching mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i hated that whole thing altogether but what i realized when i went to do some online software was okay i have to learn the new software you know, maybe I should put in an assessment. Maybe I should formalize stuff a little bit. So I drove myself bananas for two weeks and took all the spreadsheets I had done and <clears throat> retroactively looked at them to see, okay, what, what's in common. And my bias going in was, it's going to be like 20% in common. I'm a coach. I'm customizing all this stuff for everyone. And to my horror, and maybe to make it easier, I realized like, 
oh man, like 70 to 80% of it is the same. I was, and these are like pretty, you know, everything from, you know, person trying to qualify for the CrossFit games to, you know, a mom who just wants to lose 20 pounds and has three kids, you know, it was a pretty wide at the time demographic of people. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so yeah, you get like most things, like the truth is somewhere in between. Right. Sure. So you can sure. go back and see what is kind of common um, and, and start there. That doesn't mean you're a, a bad, horrible coach either. <laughs> No, not in any way. And I think that's, yeah, it's, it's really important stuff. Cause it, cause it does, it, it, it allows you to, to actually be a, a good coach at the same time. Cause you're not wasting your time rewriting the same damn template. Right. I, I mean, I, I did this. And that's for, what I was doing. For, <laughs> dude, I did this for, for nine to 10 years. I mean, it's really only been in the last couple of years, just out of necessity that I've started to, that, that I actually have templates. Like, like this is the more metabolic, local metabolic template. And then I, I just have that as a, a master template. And then I, I work different individuals into that thing. Maybe their gym yeah. equipment's different. Maybe they have certain exercises that they don't like, or they do like, or they can't do or wh- whatever the case is, but it's, it's a general outline. And I never thought that that would make my life that much easier because I am still going to take the time to look at this person's questionnaire and take Correct. in the information that they're giving me. I'm still going to take time to do that. But just the, the fact that I'm not opening up a new spreadsheet every damn time and typing it in, uh, it, it's, it's actually, it's been an amazing time saver and it's made me uh, way less resentful of, <laughs> of <my Yes. laughs> job because I hate being on the damn computer. So it, it's actually been really, really great. And it's allowed me to focus on other things and, and be a better coach because of it. And yeah, I think that we do find, you know, it's like how many movements are we actually capable of doing like in the human body? Like, like everyone's got the same ones. It's like, we got flexion, extension, external rotation, internal rotation, abduction. Like we have, like, you, there's no, you're not going to encounter somebody who has this ability that like nobody else has. It's like like that they have this, this whole new exercise where they, I don't know, they could like fling a a thing around one side of their back (laughs) and then over to the other. It's like, you're not going to encounter that person. Like it doesn't like we all have the same (laughs) movements. We just have different levels of capacity within those movements. So it inherently is going to look pretty damn similar. Like (laughs) we're all trying to go after the same, uh, we, a lot of us have the same problems, uh, so, so it's, it's, uh, I, I definitely don't think that it makes you a bad coach. I think it just allows you to be a better one when you, when you use some of these templates. Yeah. And part of it <clears throat> was completely my own neuroses of I'm hardcore. I'm starting with a blank spreadsheet for every yes. person. Like I'm yeah. custom coding all this, you know, sh- and it would take me like two to four hours. And then like you, I was kind of sort of, <clears throat> almost resentful at myself that I'm spending this much time doing it. They don't appreciate how much effort goes into this. And, you know, finally I realized like, no, they don't. And they don't care. They want the result. That's why they're paying (laughs) me. They don't give two shits if it took me six hours or or 10 minutes, if they're getting the result that they paid for and it fits with what they're doing. You know, if they tell you, you know, my favorite exercise is, you know, kettlebell swings and you never program it in then, okay, you're an idiot and you're not reading yeah. anything. And you're, dick, yeah. you're like, uh, yeah, overhead pressing works. And they're like pressing three days a week, you know, then you're just a dickhead and, you know, should, you know, take yourself out, but do something else, <laughs> but you don't need to be a complete martyr and feel like you're better because you're starting over from scratch every time, which in hindsight was a complete waste of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool. I, I have a, uh... I, I got one, one mentee that I work with that, uh, I told him, I, you know, I, I, I don't, and he'll, he may listen to this. I told him, I, I don't do mentorships. I have no capacity to do that right now. I, I don't have any kind of program. There's better people to do this. And he's like, well, let's just talk every week. And, uh, that's one thing that we've been talking about a lot. It's like, just don't do this thing that I've been doing for, for yeah. so long. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, I'm really happy that we're talking about it. Cause I, cause I really don't hear people talking about it that much. And uh, it, it really, um, I mean, for me, I have to learn everything that da- the hard way, uh, but, yeah, but so I don't do think I. that every, I don't think any, everybody else. <laughs> needs to. So, so it's cool. Uh, I think, I think that it's, I hope that this message goes through and I, and I hope that it eliminates some of the, uh, the guilt around that. If you find yourself as a coach programming, a lot of very similar things, it doesn't make you a bad coach. You probably just landed on some of the patterns that, that we just very often see that's, that's okay. Yeah, because I think it's reactionary to there's other people in the industry who I'll leave nameless who, you know, again, advertise completely custom coach. You only work with me, 
And then you see how many people they work with. And this unfortunately is more common in the bodybuilding prep world, although it's getting a lot better than it used to be. I think you may have more insight on that than I do, but <clears throat> I don't know how you could handle 75 competitors even if you did nothing, but you're glued to your computer AM, like 6 AM to 6 PM. I don't even know how that is feasible. Like, how do you even keep them straight or have the mental capacity to even want to do that? I don't know. That to me just, just seems insane. <laughs> yeah. I think what you see, and I, I don't, I don't have a, like, I have less experience with this than you would think. Like, even though I've been in bodybuilding since I was 17 competing, but I've, I have never actually worked with a coach. Uh, this will be the first year that I, that I'm going to, I'm going to work with, uh, Chris Barricat and I have, uh, awesome. tentatively made, dude. made the, uh, the commitment. Yeah. He's a great guy. I'm, nice. I'm, I'm super excited about it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, this, so it's, it's, it's challenging for me. It's going to be a, it's definitely going to be, <laughs> uh, as I giving up my control is very, very tough. Uh, but, but I think it's going to be a really good learning experience and, um, so I haven't really worked with a lot of coaches, but from what I've seen, it's like, you see either two things, you, you, you have the, the meal template guy yeah, <laughs> uh, who, who just, right. Like, so it's just, and I know the, I, I know the meal template, like it's, it's going to be broccoli and tilapia, uh, bro, broccoli and tilapia. <laughs> Maybe there's some rice in there every now and then. Oh, if you're uh, well, a guy, it's, it's broccoli and chicken. If you're a female fitness competitor, it's broccoli and tilapia. Tilapia. Well, the, the tilapia comes in later because the tilapia right. actually thins the skin of course and, of and course you don't we all know this know. yeah yeah that, that's i mean that's just obviously common knowledge um yeah you you gotta you gotta wait until the end because uh you know that, that's when it really gives you the finishing touches on stage uh so you, you got you got tilapia broccoli guy and then you've got macro guy and um you know if you're doing those two things, I can see how you could run 75 to hundred clients where it's just, yeah. they send you a photo, you send a couple numbers back uh, for the adjustments. You keep them out, you, know, you keep a spreadsheet of the, the adjustments that you made, or maybe you don't, I don't know. Uh, and then you say, or the other guy, you, you know, okay, we'll eat a, a little, eat the half a cup of rice this week instead of one cup of rice. And so I, I, I guess I could see how you would do that, but uh, I, I don't know how you would, geez, I mean, how much time you have in the day to, to really, sit down and, and write an actual meal plan for each person. And do it. I, don't think, I, mean, I have no yeah. idea. I don't know how that would be done, but yeah. And, and plus, you know, like all the other, like, to me, that is like the, the entry to coaching. That is like the base level that you should be competent with calories in calories out expenditure, exercise, nutrition. And we both know, and everyone else listening to this will nod their heads. I'm sure too, that it's so much more than that. It's like, okay, what's going on in your life? Why are you stressed out? You know, it's not that you're a bad person because you ate birthday cake last night. It's like, okay, what, what happened? You know, what are the, you know, stressors that, you know, drove you to do that? Yes. You're hungry. Yes. You're trying to step on stage. I get it. But why did you do it Friday night and not, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, mm -hmm. like those are all the things that I think a lot of those other coaches were named nameless. I just don't think, talk about and then people have something where they have a binge or they have a high caloric intake day and then it's like oh six hours of cardio tomorrow to, to make up for it and it's just yeah, this yeah. sounds like just a horrible cycle <laughs> yeah yeah I, I and i wonder how much of that is even known by the coach too right like that that right could just be kind of they could just be correcting for themselves because i because i think it does it, a lot of times it does get to be like that and I, I that's always something that that's really important to me as as a coach is i i want my clients to feel very comfortable talking to me about their their birthday cake vendors you know I, like, yeah i want i want to know like if that happens it's okay like yeah so, you're human uh, Guess you're, what? you're human <laughs> yeah yeah like that's that's totally fine uh so so that's always something that i try to make very clear is like you know if you don't finish this program or if you don't uh follow adhere to this whatever nutrition plan that we came up with together uh that's okay like this just keep me keep me in the loop here so so we can not be completely crazy and, and doing these things. Cause I, again, I've learned that the hard way I've done that stuff myself as well. Um, so coaching myself, I've, I've, I know all of my own tendencies and I, I imagine they're not that much different from a lot of other people. Uh, so I think that just having, uh, you know, making people feel comfortable enough to talk to you about that stuff and, and you're not going to, uh, completely berate them when they make a quote unquote mistake. Right. Yeah. Especially I think with Instagram, it's easy to see all the sort of the successes 
but you don't see like the laundry list of like broken people and like yeah, people that just you couldn't make it and you know i know one top competitor she basically just at the end for her prep she just lied to her coach you know because i looked at all the stuff that he wanted her to do and i asked her i said hey i know you have a life and you run a business on top of this like there's literally not enough hours in the day like there you know two hours of cardio like you know get fifteen thousand steps you know and yeah, from a calories in calories out perspective, is it, does it work? Maybe, but you know, I said, what did you do? You know, cause obviously what you did worked and she's like, well, at the end, I just got tired of telling them about it. So I just lied and told them I did it. I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I get it. Right. Because hmm. you don't want to keep having the argument and then you feel bad because you didn't complete the thing you're supposed to do. And you said this was a high priority and you know, so I, yeah. I understand it, but to me, that's just a works. completely unrealistic thing. Like the, the coach is thinking that all these things are getting done. Like simple math would tell you that it just doesn't add up, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, that's, I, that's interesting. I wonder if it's like written in knowing that people aren't going to do it, but they're going to do like 50% of it. Right. That's really what they want or something. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, yeah. Cause you look at it, you're like, how the hell you're not going to do that. Like that's not going to happen. Uh, but maybe, maybe the key, maybe the key to getting in shape is, uh, putting in fake numbers into a spreadsheet and, and then your body somehow knows the, the numbers and then, then it changes or something. I, I don't know. I'll have to try that. I have to run some, some taste. Yeah. But, yeah. Which yeah. brings me to my next question of what do you do in the, like we'll throw out all the psychological stuff on the side for now. I'm not saying it's not important, but what do you do when the numbers just don't add up, right? Like you've done this long enough where you're looking at someone's, you know, caloric intake, let's say they're training, this is just completely a hypothetical person, All right? They're training five days a week. They're doing cardio two other days. They're getting their 10,000 steps in They're you know, logging their meals and they're at like 2,200 calories and they're uh, a female. Yeah. Let's say they weigh 150, right? I won't use 120 because everyone as a female competes weighs 120 online, which is insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. At some point you're like, it just, it doesn't, you know, in your head, you're going, it doesn't add up. Like, what do you, where yeah. do you go at that no. point? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't think anybody has the answer for this exactly. Right. What like we know that something's, there's some type of adaptive thermogenesis stuff changes in need, something going on, right? Like sure. there's, there's some way that, that it's not happening, but yeah, the, the, that doesn't really change anything anyway. We have to find like, what, what's the practical way of, of attacking this thing. So for, for me, the first thing is always like, well, how much time has it been? Like, has it been an adequate amount of time to really make the assessment that this thing isn't working? Because I, I think that people do get impatient a lot of times. And for whatever yes. reason, and we'll talk about it in the context of weight loss, but I think it could still happen in, in the context of uh, gaining weight as well. Which Definitely. Just as challenging and just as frustrating and, and much more disgusting in terms of how you feel. Uh, but that's a, <laughs> that's a different, different matter. Um, so... <laughs> The first thing is just, it seems that it sometimes it happens like in spurts. I don't know if you've noticed this with, oh, with yeah. your clients, like, especially, uh, I mean, either way on the way up or the way down, it's like nothing, 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 three pounds. It's like, where the yeah. hell did that come from? We didn't change anything. Right. So I, I don't know what that's about, but it seems to be a thing. I've seen it enough times that it seems to be something. So, so that again is where it's like really useful to have a coach to just say, Hey, let's, let's just chill here for a little bit. Let's see what happens. Um, so that would be the first thing is it has been an adequate amount of time. How, how much time? I, I don't know. Like it may be of three, two, four weeks or something, if nothing's really changing, especially if we're talking about in the context of weight loss, if they're also starting to see a decrement in performance right. and they're really feeling bad and they're very food focused and they're not sleeping and all the things that you expect to happen that have to happen at the end of something like a contest prep. Right. But if we're seeing that taking place for a long period of time, then it's like, I, I think it's probably time to just pump the brakes if we can. And I, I think the best strategy seems to be like doing these uh, diet breaks at, at those times or these refeeds as, as much as possible. So that's where I like, I was seeing that for something like three weeks straight. And we really are starting to see everything's just declining. Then I would say it's time to just bring calories back up. If we have the ability to do that, sometimes that's not the most convenient time to do it, but sometimes you don't really even have a choice. So even if it's at the end of the prep and you're really not where you want to be 
uh, body comp wise, you're probably not going to get much more anyway. So you might as well try like from a bodybuilding perspective, try to fill out a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that seems to get things running again. I, I don't know exactly what's going on there. I, I don't know why that is this. You, know, you have some hypotheses why that may be the case, but I, that's, that's kind of the first thing I try to get ahead of that as much as possible by using the same strategy. Just, I, I know that after eight to 12 weeks of, of pretty severe dieting, even if we are using refeed days, uh, a few times a week, they're probably still going to need, uh, like an extended diet break at some point. So five to seven days of calories back up at, at maintenance somewhere around where we started. And uh, at the very least, it's a nice psychological break for people. Most of the time it, yeah. it helps to kind of segment the, the, the whole process of, of the, the training and the, in the prep. And I, I think there's probably some physiological things taking place there that, that allow things to get moving again. But that's uh, yeah. I mean, that's really my, my first strategy, of course, like I, I don't go to the place of like, well, make sure they're not lying to you. Cause I, I'm assuming that they're not lying to me like that. <laughs> right. But I, but I guess like you have to consider that too. Like, are, are they actually doing what there's what they're saying they're doing? And, and, but I, I, again, I would have already gotten ahead of that. I think at this point, like that would have been addressed to like, oh, oh, I'm not supposed to eat a cheesecake every night. I didn't realize that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I should have said that. I, I forgot to say explicitly don't eat an uh, entire cheesecake every night. So my fault as a coach, but yeah, I assume yeah. that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. I've even had those conversations more often than not, because again, it's like, it's not that the person is trying to actively lie to you, but there's this weird subconscious thing of like yes i weigh all my food and then you have like a piece of cheesecake that you don't weigh because in your head you're thinking oh it's not that, that much it's only one yeah. item i didn't weigh it and if you see a picture of it you're like dude that's like a quarter of the cheesecake yeah. you know but in your head you're <laughs> yeah. like i'm good yeah. i'm good bro yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, well there's the deficit for the week no, that's, that's it okay well that's I, good at least we know why yeah yeah, yeah. No, i think I that definitely does happen years ago when this happened and i'm just hitting my head against the wall she was not a competitor but she was at like 1800 calories a day and activity and performance and everything was still pretty good and i'm like what hrv was still pretty good and so we go through everything you weigh everything yeah 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 i finally said okay let's talk on the phone go through everything and she's like well you know i, I drink like three cups of coffee a day i was like oh okay do you have any trouble sleeping at night or anything no eventually i'm like well you don't put anything in your coffee do you and she goes, well, I do. And I'm thinking she's going to like, oh, you know, I put one of those little creamers in there and I'm even really worried about it. She's like, well, I put like a tablespoon of butter and at least one or two <laughs> tablespoons of coconut oil. I'm like, what? you have two to three tablespoons of oil per cup of coffee that you have three times a day. Is this correct? And she's like, well, yeah, but there's no insulin response. So that's fine. Right. I'm like, awesome. uh, but th it's still a lot of calories. <laughs> It's like an extra like, 600 calories a day. At least. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah. how about you cut back down to one every other day? And just, she started losing weight like crazy. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. I found that many times with, with uh, fat in particular sneaks in there a yeah. lot with, with oils and butter and things like that. People just don't even, don't even think about it, especially if they're eating out and stuff. It's, it's kind no, of, eating you, out you is have the worst. to know. Yeah. You just, you have to know that it's going to be that way. Unless you, unless you're eating stuff that nobody wants to eat but right. those restaurants usually aren't in business. I mean, there actually, it is nice that there, there are a lot of meal prep services now that are, that are pretty solid. Um, so that's, that's good. But, um, yeah, I think I've, I've had that conversation with multiple people. Now it's just something I, I kind of like went on a rampage for a little while there with oil with people. And I was just kept like asking everybody, are you cooking with oil? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Why don't I just, <laughs> why don't I just ask you this now? Like, that's okay. That makes a ton of sense. Like, let's start to, to monitor that a little bit. So. Or you have the other conversation of, well, yeah, I put a little in the pan. And they're like, oh, how about you measure this? And like, wow, well, you know, it's like a tablespoon and a half. They're like, but that doesn't count because it doesn't end up in the food. And I'm like, look in the bottom of the pan you when you're done cooking. <laughs> is, is there a table yeah. and a half spoon of oil left? They're like, well, no. Like, <laughs> so then it went into the food. It did just magically evaporate yeah. into the air. You, you, you don't need to <laughs> lick the pan after you're done to actually get that, that oil into your system. Yeah, it, it, it's in there. Yeah. 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 And then if you've ever worked in restaurants, like th th I oh, can guarantee dude. you that the, the chef back there is not going, <laughs> oh, you know, the macros up front really say that ah, it's just more oil, more whatever, dude. you know, it, it just, that, yeah, it yeah. just happens. 
Yeah, I've I've worked in those kitchens. I, I know exactly how that goes. Yeah. And the, the, <laughs> the least of your worries should be how much butter is in this food. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, there's no way that that person, uh, that 16 year old uh, sous chef in the, in the back there gives a shit about <laughs> your macros. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other pretty mentioned too about it being nonlinear to me has just been fascinating. Because for years I've kept, you know, just daily body weight because I want to see the variation and you want to see the trend, right? Because if someone just does their way in every Sunday, it's like, I started running to people that would do the craziest shit on Saturday because they knew they're going to weigh themselves on Sunday. Yeah. Um, and then it's just even one data point. And if they're up like a you know, pound and a half, they would lose their shit. And so you got to try to talk them off the ledge for three days. And it may have just been they were retaining water because especially women it was that time of the month or they drank more fluid or whatever. So I found just by getting them to do daily weights, you can kind of see the variation. And what I've noticed is the exact same thing you said. It's like nothing, nothing, up, down, up, down, boof, lost three pounds, up, down, up, down, up, down, lost two pounds. Or yep. it's almost never like, like straight linear. And again, this is body weight, not body fat. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've noticed when they start losing that fine scale variability, like that makes me nervous, right? So if they're weighing in and they're like 150.1, 149.9, 150.1, 150.2, 150.0, I get more nervous about that than if their average was 150 and they're like 148.1, you know, 151.5, 150.1, right? They're oscillating a little bit around that number. The rate of loss or weight stable is about the same. But I've just noticed time and time again, when that fine scale variability goes away, it just seems like they're more likely to be stuck at a plateau, either going up or down. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I've never thought about that before, but I've definitely noticed that uh, with myself and with, with, uh, with clients for sure. It's like that. It, it seems to correlate when just things are not going well altogether. It's like, yeah. that. I think of that, like when I, when I think of that, I'm like thinking of my, my weigh-ins at the end of prep. Yeah. And, um, and it, you know, I even like looking at things like heart rate variability where heart variability is like going through the roof. Like it's, it's like all of a sudden like resting heart rate, super, super low and heart rate variability is really, really high. And that's also around when that's starting to happen. And then it's like, you know, I haven't had an erection in three months. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't stop thinking about food. I see people and I'm thinking about, you know, that they would probably tastes pretty good if I put them on a grill. <laughs> uh, like, uh, there's just, there's, uh, you know, every, every waking moment, it's just like, you know, looking at stairs and wishing there was somehow a way that I could just end up right. on top One of those of little seats that walking. goes up on them. Yeah. Like, yeah, like how do I stall that? <laughs> uh, you know, like, I mean, you know, the, the, the craziest thing, the funniest thing to me is when I, I used to work at a gym that had two levels and it was, so it was a pretty big gym. And what I started to notice was that I never went upstairs anymore. And it yeah. was like, you know, I do my, I write my programs for my clients and it was, it was like, subconsciously, I was writing everything to be on, on, on the floor level. <laughs> like, I was like, like, why do I don't, how come I don't do leg curls with anyone upstairs anymore? It's like, it was almost like I was getting ahead of it, just knowing that I was not going to want to walk up the stairs. So yeah, there's a lot of that stuff going on, but that, that to me would be at the same time where those plateaus are really taking place. So it's, it, yeah, I guess that's like your, your body really defending that that setting point at that, that that spot i suppose i mean what's your what's your thought process on on why that may I be mean, the case just that's my thought right so we look at most physiologic systems you know you're going to have some fine scale variability and that's a marker of health all systems are cooperating they're kind of properly coupled together and when we lose that fine scale variability such as in heart rate variability um, sway. There's some stuff with gait. I mean, I did some stuff with RER looking at metabolic heart data off of people to try to, you know, equate metabolic flexibility. It just seems like every time we lose that fine scale variability, they're, they're not in a happy place, right? Like yeah. some shit's going on. And I just noticed that with body weight also for probably the last seven years. And I've tried to get like some app developers to to look into it because it's super easy to do. I mean, I can show them how to do the math and how to run it. Um, it just seems to happen. And like everybody I've talked to, it, it just seems like it's something that they also notice. And I think it's useful because if I see a loss of variability and the plateau is shorter, odds are I'm going to be more aggressive sooner than if I still see that variability, even though the average isn't changing. 
right? So let's say I've got one person where it's only been a week, but they have their body weight shows no variability at all. They're just boom, they're just 150 dead nuts on versus someone else that's say identical for over three weeks, they're kind of oscillating up and down a little bit with fine scale variability, but the average is still the same. I feel like I'm going to let them ride longer because I don't think they're at a point where I need to be so aggressive. I think they'll auto correct on their own. Right. Mm -hmm. And then boom, all of a sudden you see two and a half weeks in, they lose like three pounds. Mm -hmm. So I kind of use it as a marker to, to try to cross check to see, okay, how aggressive should I be getting and how soon should I do it? Interesting. So what kind of changes would you make at that, at that time? Like, what does it look like to get more aggressive at that point? Yeah. So that's, what's interesting. So at first my answer was always, okay, if they're going down, I'm just going to cut their calories even more. But as you know, you, at some point you just run out of runway, right? I mean, what are you going to be doing? Like eating 400 calories, you know, two weeks before your show. I mean, come on. Right. I mean, you, you just, you eventually at some point you just run out of room and your body hates you even more than what it did before. Um, so now I, I tell clients, it's like, if you get a car stuck in like the winter here in Minnesota, like you don't just push on it. Like your whole goal is like to start, you know, rocking the car back and forth Mm -hmm. and try to get some momentum. Like, what are you doing to the system? You're, you're trying to inject that fine scale variability and then you push it out of the snowbank. Right. So the question I asked myself then is I'm probably going to be more dramatic and aggressive, but then the question is, do I need to go up or down? Yeah. And a lot of times I'll go up which freaks the crap out of clients, right? Because I'm like, my goal is to inject some fine skill variability and then see it move. I'm not as concerned about the direction yet. And I know that if I cut even more, I'm nervous about just running out of runway, right? But if it's a short, maybe bump in calories, it's not going to affect their long-term progress. If they start working again for God knows whatever mechanisms are governing this, if we're even correct, I've just noticed that they'll go up like two or three pounds and then all of a sudden they'll start dropping. And then a week later, they're like below where they were before. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you get lucky. Like sometimes I had a client who was a competitor a couple of years ago, it was just super stuck, super stuck. Yeah. It's just probably like four weeks out. And I'm like, well, you know, we got a little bit of time. She wasn't that far out. She was, you know, pretty good, but she just starts getting super nervous. She's like, you know, on my head, I was thinking I was going to be like, you know, down two more pounds. And, and I'm like, okay, how about Wednesday night? uh, in terms of your normal calories, just have another 120 grams of carbohydrates. And she's like, what? You're an idiot. This is insane. I'm only at, you know, 80 grams of carbs. This is 200 grams of carbs in one day. I'm like, you'll be fine. Even if those extra hundred percent converted to fat, which it's not going to, you're talking about almost an undetectable amount. Right. And she's like, okay, okay. Gets on the scale the next day, lost like a pound and a half. Yeah. You know, and, Mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's a stress response. I don't know if it's water. I don't know what it is, but sometimes you see that happen too. And again, you're talking about scale weight, not body fat, you know, so you do just see weird stuff. (laughs) It usually, it usually looks like a a decrease in body fat as well too. Cause they look like, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're eating 80 grams of carbohydrates, uh, it's pretty safe to say that you, you probably don't have completely capped out glycogen. Oh yeah. It's not even close. Not (laughs) if you're training that hard either. There's no way. Yeah. yeah, There's no way. Like it's like, we know they're not completely depleted, but they're sure as hell not capped out. So it's like, you're talking an extra hundred grams of carbohydrate. Uh, you got plenty to, to store before you even start converting that to body fat. So you're just going to probably end up storing more glycogen in the tissues that you're training, especially, right. <laughs> and you're just going to like, you're going to look more filled out. It's going to push out against the skin. You know, that's uh bodybuilding talk, right? right? It's yeah, just yeah. like this, like, yeah, <laughs> but, but it actually, it's a real thing. It's like, it's like you're yeah. seeing this like cell swelling kind of take place in a sense. Uh, there's just more substrate in the tissue is pushing out. Like you're going to end up looking tighter anyway. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's cool. That's where it's like, you know, it's some, there's, there's always talk about, well, how much do we educate our clients and how much, you know, they clients don't give a shit about glycogen and all that stuff, or, you know, some of the, the, and I mean, you could go far deeper into it than, than I, but there, there is a certain level of education that I think that we need to provide as coaches, because knowing that's actually really helpful. It's like, Hey, like, yeah. you know, you realize like, you, you know, with the amount of muscle you have, like you could store 500 grams of carbohydrate. So if we, if we gave you 200 grams of carbohydrate, you're probably not, 
completely capped out there. And, and by the way, even if you did, you still got to put some into your liver as well. Like, so there's, there's probably some um, amount of this that it can't even get converted to, to body fat. So, so just knowing a little bit of that is, is actually really useful. I think it can make people feel like, Oh, okay. I guess that, that does make sense. Unless this guy's completely full of shit and just making stuff up. But you know, I think, I think it's helpful. Yeah. Wasn't that some of the old data by, was it Atkinson? I could have got that wrong, but where they did like massive carbohydrate overfeeding in people for like, I want to say one, two, three, like five days in a row and did biopsies and stuff. And the short answer, which again, I could have completely botched the study was that they didn't really gain any fat, right? They, if they were glycogen depleted, almost all of it went to glycogen, both liver and muscle. It took multiple days to cap out the muscle glycogen and body weight went up a little bit, but not substantial. Right. And they did, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if they measured body fat in the experiment or not. Um, and then if you look at healthy people for metabolism, most of the time, if you start overfeeding them carbohydrates, they'll actually oxidize more carbohydrates, where mm -hmm. if you overfeed people fat, they just tend to store more fat. Again, that's a theoretical thing, but it does kind of explain why if you look at like old school bodybuilding diets in general, other than the weird crazes that come and go, I would say, I don't know what your opinion would be, is that high protein as high a carbohydrates as you can get away with, but probably lower fat. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I can't really think of any cases why that wouldn't be the case. I, unless yeah. it just, it was just like an adherence thing or something. Someone just really, it's usually just a belief thing. Someone has been right told that high carbohydrate diets make you fat. That That's the only time that I've really seen that be useful. And it's just like, I, I don't feel like arguing with this person. Like they seem to be really <laughs> said on this thing and like, you know, whatever. Uh, but it, uh, it makes way, way more sense to me. I, I the, every bodybuilding contest diet eventually just ends up being a low everything diet, except for oh, protein, of course, right? like especially at, at some point, it's, especially at the end, but you know, but it does, it does make sense that, uh, to, to really try to cap out carbohydrates the whole way through from a performance standpoint and, and, uh, from a aesthetic standpoint, like, a, like you, you're just going to, I mean, we do have a certain amount of like, uh, of injured muscular triglycerides uh, on, on board. Right. So like, you don't want to completely deplete that, but it seems like the, uh, the, the glycogen and the, and the subsequent water uh, along with that, like has a much bigger impact on, on the look and the performance. So, um, and yeah, like you just mentioned, like it's probably, it's, it seems like it's a little bit easier to, uh, to store fat as adipose tissue than it is carbohydrate for, for those reasons. So I, yeah, I'm a big fan. And like the, you're eating more. Usually there's like this, there's yeah. more to actually eat with carbohydrates. <laughs> so you're going to feel a little bit more full, uh, where, yeah, if you add a, you know, you add a tablespoon of oil, it's like, I don't know, I'm not going to, maybe you'll feel it later, but during that meal, it's like, this is the same size meal. Right. And I think it's really nice to be able to add some actual substance to your meals. So yeah, I would agree yeah. with that. What did John Meadows call it? When you get to the end of prep, I think he called it lettuce mode. <laughs> you're just like eating roughage and protein and that's it. Uh, yeah. 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 There's, there's a point where it, like, it, it actually does become easier. Cause you're just like, well, I'm just giving up on the idea of food. Like food right. doesn't really <laughs> happen anymore. So, so that's cool. I, I, I mean, I used to wrestle. So wrestling was, actually, oh, there you go. it was, it was actually pretty easy. Cause it was like, you're okay. You leave practice in your, your half a pound under and your weigh-ins are the next morning. It's like, okay, I can, I can eat half a pound of food, like, which isn't really, a lot of not food that much it's not very much but it's but it's just it's kind of easier in a sense because you're you're basically what's gonna end up happening is you're just not gonna eat and right. when, you're, when you're not eating you're just like all right i just got to distract myself from this thing but when you're when you're eating these these little baby meals that, that have nothing in them uh that's that's kind of like the, the worst thing ever is just you're just constantly reminded of how hungry you are so <laughs> and that's another point like I've, I've kind of shifted more towards a a lower frequency uh, of eating. Cause I, yeah. I was definitely, I was definitely in the, um, you know, I, I've, I have, I have cried, uh, being 30 minutes late for meals in the past. I mean, I, I, I can remember multiple times, one time in particular that I, I literally was, was crying. Um, I'm not ashamed to say it. I should be ashamed, <laughs> but it was, I was a few weeks out from my first bodybuilding contest and I, I was 17 and I got stuck in this stupid meeting for, uh, I used to do this, it was, it was, a uh, one of these like network marketing companies mm. and, and, and the meeting was going like half an hour later than it was supposed to. And I'm just tweaking out 
uh, in, in this, I'm, I'm like for my meal, like I'm going to miss my meal. I'm losing all my muscle. I can feel my muscle literally <laughs> feel yourself. Getting I'm like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm so catabolic right now. Like I, I, I can anybody else see me getting smaller like, I'm saying anything. <laughs> Uh, and, and I, I, yeah, I remember like just thinking that that was so important. And then what it ends up being is you, like, you're eating eight to nine meals a day on 2,200 calories. Yeah, <laughs> so like bird food. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's terrible. It's like, you're eating like a little nugget of food every couple hours. Like, oh yeah, I'm still hungry. Uh, good. Yeah. I'm glad, glad I got a nice reminder there. So yeah, I don't know if that had anything to do with what we were originally talking about, but it just reminded me of that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, uh, but, yeah. Re rethinking some of this stuff. Yeah. But I think even that's a, at some point, not that I say you, you throw all physiology out the window, but when there's not that much of a difference between smaller meals, meal frequency, bigger meals, you're, you're really at that point kind of splitting hairs. But if you have someone who you're like, man, old school, six meals a day, and you're at like a thousand calories, oh, you're like, F you, like torture. you're going to be hungry all the and you just get enough food just to be more hungry like yeah, i don't think you ever even get does. remotely close to feeling like you ever even ate anything but yeah, you could take yeah. those same uh calories which is still extremely low and have three meals of 300 calories i granted super low but you can kind of do a little bit of something with that right yeah, you can back you to our on a plate you know, instead of a tilapia and broccoli right and you could it looks yeah. you could look at it and it looked like food you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah no, i think that i think that's a big deal yeah yeah i think that's what I was, I was thinking about the uh just the difference between like wrestling and uh and bodybuilding at that uh, time where it's like i'd rather just not eat if i'm gonna eat uh, a 200 calorie meal right now i, I don't even want it <laughs> yeah i mean, i've noticed that when when i started doing intermittent fasting god probably 11 years ago my first thought was, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, right? I, I remember being at Subway, a buddy of mine, shout out Jason Reimer. He's like, yeah, man, I started doing this, you know, one hour of, of fast for like one day a week. And it's been amazing. I'm like, what, what the hell are you talking about? This is probably 12 years ago now, maybe longer than that. And I'm like, what? And so I started looking at the research and then uh, Brad Pilon came out with his book, Eat, Stop, Eat, which I bought. And it probably took me about six or eight months to convince myself that, if you go through a period of not eating, like all the muscle is not going to fall off your body, right? Because I was convinced by that point that, you know, oh, you're missing out on muscle protein synthetic response, muscle protein breakdown is going to get higher. You went from, you know, high intake, you're going to oxidize protein and all this stuff. But if you looked at the actual studies on it, which are extremely limited, you're like, oh, you're, you're definitely probably not gaining a ton of muscle for sure, but you're not losing all of it, right? I mean, at least on a shorter fast, as far as what we know now. Um, so I remember trying it out and playing around with it. Didn't go so well. Eventually got to a point where it did a little bit more progressively, started doing it with clients. And my thought with clients was like, this is going to be a disaster. Like maybe this is okay in research, even though it's preliminary, but clients are going to hate this, right? A period of time where you're not eating. And these are not like, you know, extremely competitive people are going to step on stage. But what I found was, and for myself too, is that it was easier to do a period of time not eating than it was to have a very low caloric day, right? It would yeah. be easier for me if I worked my way up to it. I could do 12, even now, like I can do 12 to 20 hours and I'm hungry. You know, it's not super fun, but it's not too bad. But if I were to do that same period and you said, bro, you only get 300 calories today. And I've tried this. It's so much harder <laughs> just mm -hmm. from a pure compliance standpoint. Yeah, I don't know totally. why that is, but it just seems to be that way. Yeah, I don't know. It's I I, I noticed, and I don't know if you noticed this as well. It, it tends to come in waves, like the hunger oh, comes definitely. in waves, hundred percent. So I, I wonder, and, and that you know, there's a million things that could could lead to to hunger and thinking about food, yeah. right? But but I I wonder if it has something to do with uh, like maybe you are beginning to oxidize different uh, substrates at some some points, like you need to to not have readily available uh, substrate coming in in order to do that. It's like, it's almost like you disrupt that when you, when you eat a little bit of food or something, I, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but that, that's something I definitely noticed where like, as long as you, if you can make it through this, this 30 minute wave, you're going to have another few hours where you really don't think about food as long yeah. as you allow yourself to. I mean, if, if, if you're going to spend that, uh, the next few hours standing outside of a Krispy Kreme, then you're probably going to be pretty hungry, <laughs> but you know, like if you can like distract yourself for a little while, just go do something. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times, like I, the, the thing that I, I love about, cause I, I'll use intermittent fastingly as well. 
Um, I'll use it intermittently, um, but <laughs> yeah, it, it it's it actually I love it for the days where I have to just like crush something cognitive. Oh, yeah. Like it, because it just because it, like eating for one is just kind of a disruption a lot of times, and, and it does typically make me feel a little bit groggy afterwards, especially if I'm like in a in a gaining phase. Like I, I'm going to be diabetic after every meal <laughs> for for the entire off season, so that's really not conducive for for getting a lot of a lot of hard mental effort in. So that I find to be really helpful. So just using those days, like, all right, well, I'm not going to eat until 2 p.m. today. So I'm, I'm going to be able to really crush stuff. And, and your your level of focus is really, really high, typically, which is really nice. Yeah, I thought the same thing, too, that it's anecdotal and I don't have any direct lab measures, but it just seems that if your body is better able at using fat as a fuel, right, so you can upregulate fatty acid oxidation. You're fasting, right? So everyone who poo poos this idea, they're like, oh, but if you hook people up to a metabolic heart, you know, you're not really seeing what's going on because the food will change it. And yeah, I think that's true, right? I mean, baseline RQ or RER is kind of more related to baseline diet than anything else. Um, but I do think that if your body has the ability to switch and to use fats more easily as a fuel, it just seems like fasting becomes an actual possibility then, right? Mm, so what I would yes. love to see, and I don't know if this study has been done, just measurement of fatty acid oxidation and have people get used to a longer period of fasting. So take, you know, six, eight weeks and then have them do like a 20 to 24 hour fast relatively easy. Maybe do some low level aerobic fastic training and some other stuff and you increase their uh, VO2 max right? Higher VO2 max, use a higher percentage of fat as fuel. You can look at fat max and a bunch of other stuff. But my thought would be that I think we get too hung up on the actual macronutrient we're using and we forget what that means for compliance, right? So my thought would be that if you're better at using fat as a fuel, it's easier for you to physically do a 19 to 24 hour fast. Therefore, your compliance in doing it is going to be better compared to Bob, who is used to eating every three hours and he's got a white knuckle it for 24 hours and it's going to end in just, you know, birthday cake feast 101, right? Mm -hmm. Physiology wise, you can say, oh, but they both made it through the same period of time. It's just calories, bro. They cut all the calories out. But do you think Bob who had a white knuckle it through is really ever going to try to attempt that again? Like yeah, probably yeah. not. A miserable experience for him. Right. Yeah. So the other person who is better able to use fat as a fuel, even if we say calories in calories out is the only thing that matters. I just think from a compliance standpoint, it now becomes a real option for them to do where in the case of white knuckling it through, you're like, ah, screw that. I'm never doing that again. Yeah. So, so how would you get someone up to that point? Like, cause you mentioned the fasting cardio that like that to me is uh, like setting off some, some bells for me. Cause I, cause I, I remember being, for like my first introduction to a lot of training and even the cardiovascular training was like, I came up in like the, the hit era. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, so, so there was, if you did low intensity exercise, like it was not only a waste of time, but it was also going to, to burn up all of your muscles somehow. Right. right. So very catabolic, uh, bro. Super <laughs> catabolic. Whereas like high intensity exercise is actually anabolic. Um, so, so I did all of that, uh, for, mm. for the longest time and, and how to go. I, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I like to torture myself. Like, so I think yeah. it was, I think it was beneficial in the long run because it, it's created a lot of context for me and just remembering how awful that all that crap was. And when I do now, it's <laughs> just idiot. way easier. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it's just way easier. So, and I still, I still enjoy going to those places really just, just, to, uh, for suffering purposes and the satisfaction I derive from that. Cause I'm a weirdo, but I, I think that there's, there, there, uh, there's like a correlation there between like when I started doing lower intensity work and learning how to like, I don't know, use my, my nose to breathe <laughs> instead of just hyperventilating, like from the right. get go on every single effort that I do and getting super hyper aroused for everything. Uh, and, and the ability to, to actually not eat for long periods of time and, and not freak out. So I, I'm, I'm curious if there's like, if that's a strategy that you use intentionally for their uh, ability to be able to, to start to implement some of those, those fasting strategies that you see a correlation with that. Possibly like the literature on it's I've, I've gone back and forth on this, like so many times, right? Because like now within the last couple of years, if you even mention the words 
fasted cardio. Like number one, people assume that you only give a shit about body comp and that's all. Right. So everyone almost online is going to assume that it's a body comp thing. And I've had people send me hate mail of like, bro, you were talking about fasted cardio. And don't you know that if someone did that, they could still be using some other type of fat. And when you measure on a metabolic cart, you're not always looking at body fat, that it could be dietary fat that they took it in, like on a ketogenic diet. And I'm like, yeah, but we weren't talking exclusively about body comp. Well, that's what we all inferred when we're listening to it. And hey, that's that's on you. <laughs> so man. It's like everyone like, puts it in their own kind of frame yeah, of reference, yeah. which you know is good feedback. So to qualify the context you're talking about is helpful. You know, and then they always have the well, didn't you see Brad Schoenfeld's study where he looked at this and he said it didn't matter? And you know, it, yeah, a six-week study on females, they didn't use a metabolic cart. And if you even talk to Brad, he's like, Well, you know, maybe at a higher level, if they're more competitive, it might have made a difference. Right. So even the guy who did the author of the study is like saying, well, it's not that big of a difference, but you know, in this other population, maybe it matters. We don't have any data. So I don't know. I think it probably helps, but you know, some of the newer data, like Jeff Rothschild has some stuff showing that what you eat immediately before doesn't appear to affect oxidization as much as what we thought. But again, I think there's going to be limits to that, right? If I have four pop tarts and whack my insulin sky high, it's probably going to move my RER, right? If I have a moderate amount of food, that's a mixed meal with protein and, you know, carbohydrates and fat, yeah, probably not that big of a deal. Right. And again, in, in the real world, it's like by far and away, like do the exercise number one, right? Everybody agrees yeah. that that's going to buy you the most benefit. And after that, worry about the state that you're going to do it in. So my argument mm -hmm. has just generally been, it's just easier to do fasted cardio. Because it, like, what is the reason and the list of excuses you have beforehand, All right? Think of all the questions you normally get. Oh, well, what do I eat beforehand? Don't worry about it. Well, what do I have to do this, this warm up? I'm doing high intensity stuff. I need a big warm up. No, you're doing low intensity. You've, bro, if you need to warm up for that, you have other issues, right? <laughs> so like the amount of excuses you can just cross off the list so that they just get it done, I think is just easier with that you know, mm -hmm. body comp. Eh, I don't know. I mean, I do think there, there may be a benefit to increasing fatty acid oxidation, but again, the research is very split. I mean, the, the biggest thing from an exercise standpoint is probably their VO2 max, right? I mean, if you've just got a bigger aerobic engine, even if your percentage of fuel you're using is different, you're still burning like on a calories basis, way more calories from fat, right? Yep. So that's the thing that I pay the most attention to. You know, if their VO2 max is like a freaking field mouse at like 19 or something, it's like, man, you need to work on that first. You're just completely out of shape. You mm -hmm. know, if, if it's pretty high and again, you don't need to be, you know, a, you know, cross country in a region skier of, you know, eighties or some crazy thing like that. But if you're in the forties or fifties, depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. I think that's probably, you know, pretty decent, you know, from there. Yeah. Maybe worry about fasted, but again, that comes back to lifestyle what do you have time to do what's the easiest thing to do what's not going to interfere with your other training because we've seen that with the high intensity stuff it's like yeah you look at a lot of martin gabalia stuff amazing research huge benefits even an untrained population i think there's definitely a time and a place for it but anyone who's done a lot of true high intensity training it's not fun and it's fatiguing and it will take away from some of your weight training at some point just because there's only so much high intensity shit you can do, especially when you start lowering your calories, you start lowering your carbohydrates, you know, and sleep or shit, you know, all the other stuff that, that factors into it. So I don't think, again, there's a right or a wrong, but my bias is like, you know, weight training should be your number one priority. Like make sure your performance is good there, do some higher intensity stuff. And then you can probably maximize and expand lower intensity work and even step count has a lot more capacity to change even in a low caloric state than a mm -hmm. lot of the high intensity stuff. Because the people I've seen try to do high intensity work at the end, some people can do it. They tend to have a much higher aerobic base than other people. But a lot of times, if you monitor their output, their output is just like, just, yeah. just super low. And it's hard. I mean, it feels like horrible, but if you look at what they're actually burning from a true caloric sense, it's actually a lot less. So that's my little yeah. edge.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that, I, I mean, I'm, I've, over the last few years, I've really come to appreciate the aerobic system and, and how important some of that lower end stuff is because I yeah. really was, was adamantly against it previously. Like anytime that I would look at any endurance athlete, I'm like, wow, cool. You just did something <laughs> really easy for a really, really long time. Right. That's excellent. And, and now I've definitely gained a different appreciation for it. And a lot of that is actually is uh, from, from reading the book Endure, which I, I, I Oh, I love that read. book. Fantastic awesome. Book. Alex Hutchinson. Yeah. Yeah. Great book. Um, and, you know, and also listening to, to, to guys like you talk about nasal breathing work and all that that's, I think it's made a, a pretty big impact. I just look at it now as, as like the, the bigger your aerobic engine is the, the bigger your just adaptive potential is for, for everything. Oh, yeah. uh, the, you know, just from like a nervous system perspective, I mean, you're just less likely if every time you stand up and walk into the kitchen, you're, you're, you're going 110 beats per minute. Like you're not <laughs> spending your day in a predominantly parasympathetic state. And that's not going to be great for, for adaptation for any, of any sort. And I mean, less the adaptation you're going for is uh, I don't know, hardened arteries or something <laughs> uh, but that's fine if you are like, uh, but yeah like, i i look at it as just uh in, in the fasted cardio like you said just being a a very easy way to to get it uh yeah because because i i don't think the fasting part really matters all that much it's just like are you getting that low intensity stuff so when i hear it, you know first thing in the morning cardio it's like i i know that's probably not going to be super high intensity cardio it's going to be pretty chill it's actually a really nice way to start the day a lot of times yeah yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I think there's uh there's just so many benefits to that, even for someone who's not primarily focused on that, uh, you know, for, for like someone like myself, like, I don't, I don't really care all that much about my aerobic performance, but it, it definitely, uh, I, I believe that it has some, some carryover into my ability to do efficient and, and productive work for the things that I do care about. Yeah. And I use as an example too, of people who don't necessarily do classic aerobic training, but you know, when Ben had you do the 2k in Costa Rica, like your numbers were, were really good. I think I came in when you were just finishing the test and you're just, you know, hammering it and you finished it. And I, I was like, looked at your time. It was like fucking six fifty seven. It was like sub seven, I think for a 2k, which to me is like super impressive, I you know, for someone that. who's not a dedicated rower. Right. I mean, that's not mm -hmm. your, your main stick. <laughs> And I asked him, I'm like, what did you do? He's like, oh, Ben came in here. He just told me, don't let that other pace boat beat you. So that's what I did. <laughs> that's it. A very simple meathead. It's just give me a task. <laughs> yeah. It'll at least distract me for, for less than seven minutes, I guess. Yeah. 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 I asked Ben, yeah. I'm like, well, what pace did you set it at? He's like, oh, I put it like 655. <laughs> I was like, shit. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it works. Yeah. I, I didn't know the, the rower gets so annoying to me because I start to, um, I almost like start to get ahead of myself because I'm just really bad at it. Like I haven't really learned how to do it yet. So I'll start my, it starts to become really choppy for me, the, the technique. So I, I start to get really annoyed with that, which is probably helpful because it makes me angry and then it makes me <laughs> harder. So thinking, and then that, you know, that the little fishies are swimming away on the, on the, the screen. So <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that helped me the most was, oh yeah. Like when I do a max test, it's going to be several minutes long. So I shouldn't be a complete spaz monkey the whole time. Right. Cause like, it's <laughs> yeah, so easy yeah. because you, you're trying so hard and it's just so miserable the whole time. Anyway, it's so easy to get discoordinated and to think that you're really trying hard and you are, it's just like your arms and legs are just not coordinated at all. Yeah. Right? yeah. So for me, especially under max tests or like, you know, RPEs of like, you know, nine to 10 was like, just to think about, Okay, drive with your legs. And then as it gets more tiring, just focus on the average watts that I need to hit. And then I have to keep telling myself, okay, smooth is fast, smooth is fast. Because uh -huh. it's so easy just to get ahead of yourself, right? And your your arms and your legs are just like not coordinated at all. And you're like, ah! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Screw it. I don't need my legs anymore. Right. Just my arms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's why I like the uh the echo bike. Like because that that's echo to me, bike, you can like, get away with it on that. Oh uh, yeah, it's just the ultimate it's form miserable of suck. though. Oh it's yeah, so bad. It, it, it's so bad. Uh yeah, I mean I, so I uh I bought it, I just bought an echo bike for my gym because oh, I was nice. like, you know, I've just I've just spent too much time on this thing that 
I need other people to feel the pain that I felt. <laughs> so it was really important to me. And I actually, it, it actually is really important to me from, from a training perspective, because I, I think it really does teach people. So you got to have something like that. The thing that's cool that I've really come to appreciate about uh, traditional aerobic training, and I guess, uh, however, we're defining ro- aerobic training, right. and, you know, I guess we should call it cardiovascular training or, sure. or something, uh, some, something you can do uh, cyclically and uh, for a long yeah. period of time. Repetitive, but, cyclic, it, rhythmic motion. Yeah. Yeah, we'll call it we'll call it that so no one gets upset about aerobic <laughs> versus uh, anaerobic stuff or whatever that means. Um, so the, the thing that I come to appreciate about it is that you, you always have one more repetition in you. Like there's oh, always yeah. one more rotation. There's always one more pull. And the only reason that you don't get it is because you didn't want to really. So that that's that's pretty cool. And you think about it in those terms, it's like, yeah, these guys are pretty badass. Like that that really do these these uh, long distances or or anything in that. Uh, that mid distance or it, it's just it because it is just so it's so gnarly where you, you can't really do that on a on a on a bench press or something or any weight training like it's like there, there's a pretty hard stop and you might be able to muster up uh, a couple more reps but it's like once it's done it's kind of done but on the on the you know on the echo bike for example like i mean you can always keep going like it might slow down but you, if you just keep pushing as hard as you can eventually i don't know what happens i haven't ever seen anyone die um, <laughs> So I, I mean, I feel like I've come pretty close. Like, I feel like I've seen, I've seen the light, um, Matt Frazier standing at the top of it, just <laughs> laughing at me. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, I, I, it's taught me a lot for sure. Yeah. And I think I'm having flashbacks to all the heinous stuff Pat made us do in Costa Rica and oh, yeah. some of the, uh, what was stuff, man? Uh, what was the, I'm blanking on it. I should know it the the five rounds of the three rounds five exercises he lost his toe yeah the um that we were i guess that was technically a that was like a modified cajun is what he was cajun, calling it. that's the, what it was the 20 the 2040 yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so yeah, for so people listening a, it was what 20 well 20 seconds on 10 seconds off is that right is that what we're doing 2010 so, no, 20, 2040. The 10 is the, 20, the 40, amount of repetitions okay. that you're expected to get. So you have 20 that's seconds right, to get 10 right. reps, then 40 second rest. Yeah. And then you do that between what was it? Trap bar deadlifts, bench, pull up. What were the other two? Incline back press squat. and back squat, right? Yes. Back squat and then incline. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do that as a round. And then you've got a couple of minutes rest and then do it again and then rest and then do it again is just, yep. you start off and you're like, you know, this isn't too bad. I'm doing okay. You know, by like the third exercise, you're starting to hate life, but like the fourth and fifth exercise, you're like, what, how did I get so weak? I feel yeah. so weak, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. especially out there, <laughs> like, especially like, in the heat. who poured all this water on me. Like, it's like what is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you see people just like Dobbs just wander out of there and just collapse, like literally laying on the floor in the next room. Like, are you okay? He's like, yeah. And I remember, God, someone was testing and we were down uh, by the the little shower down by the kitchen there. And um, uh, Anthony comes by, uh, not fuzzy hair, Anthony, but um, Anthony and Dean, Anthony. I think harder. Yeah. Harder. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He, he walks by in the background and passes out like almost having a convulsion like under the shower and i'm looking over and i don't remember who i was talking to and they look over at the same time and they just start losing it They're like oh my god he's having a seizure what's going on <laughs> and like pat walks by and he goes ah just fucking cajun he's fine and i, I went over there i'm like you're all right he's like yeah yeah i'm okay i'm okay <laughs> Oh uh, man. Yeah. It, it's, it, I, I do a, um, I'll do a cycle of like a modified, cause I actually think the 30, 30 is even worse. Like the traditional, oh, like patch 30, 30 is actually worse. So it's 15 reps, uh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds to get 15 reps, then 30 seconds off. And there's even more 10 miserable. different exercises. So I, I do a modified version of that just cause it's easier to set it up. So it, it'll be a, a, a trap bar deadlift, a bench press, a pull up rear foot elevated split squat, uh, overhead press and a, and a chest supported row. And that 30, 30 set up with two minutes rest and it's four rounds. Mm-hmm. And so that, that workout takes 32 minutes. Exactly. Oh. Uh, I have to, I have to Matt, I have to plan out three hours in my day to actually do that <laughs> workout because it takes me a solid 45 minutes just to get started for like yeah. you know, me to just get myself in that place. So like, okay, this oh, is yeah. coming. I'm here. 
I've been thinking about this all weekend. Here it is. Um, maybe I should just puke now. And then it's like, you know, it's like it, now it's become like it's just a response. It's like I finish the last set of rows and then I just walk out and puke and then just kind of lay down, hopefully not in the puke, but sometimes I'm not so lucky. <laughs> and then it's like and it's a good like four, like 40 minutes. Like I'll usually actually fall asleep. Uh, and just kind of like wake up, like, what happened? Do I have to do more? Uh, is it over? Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's like, you know, obviously that stuff, you, when you're taking it to that place, like that's not somewhere you should be going every day. Like that, that no. can very easily become a very big problem, but yeah. I think you gotta go there at some point. You gotta know you at gotta, least what gotta, it's like. You gotta know what that's like, man. Cause it really, it really does build a context for everything else. And, and, and training in, in life, honestly, like, I think if you can endure something like that, it, it becomes, everything else becomes a little bit easier. And so, you know, for me personally, going back into bodybuilding training after that, it's like, ah. <laughs> you know, I have to do some bicep curls and, you know, a couple sets of squats or something like, come on, like, I mean, it's going to be hard. I'm going to put in as much effort as I can into that, yeah. but there's no way that that exercise can take as much out of me as that, that 30, 30. So, so yeah, I think uh, having that context is, is really important. Just like that, that, the tolerance to, to stress is, uh, it's a big, big deal. Yeah. And that's why I kind of like the rower for that too, because you can take people who, because the biggest thing that I worry about is that in inexperienced people, it turns into kind of very bad CrossFit, right? Your risk yeah. versus reward yeah. is just, you know, on a back squat that looks like a bad good morning, your straight bar deadlift yeah, looks sketchy. like a pooping dog. You know, and, and people who are experienced, then yeah, they're used to managing stuff under load. It's it's a little bit different, but on new people, it's like oof. But on a rower, you can you can teach. They may not have the best form or technique, but out of all things to do, that's really exhaustive. Assault bike would be the same. It's a pretty safe biomechanical movement for the most part. Yeah. You know, and even if you're just doing three minutes where you're not actively pacing yourself, like you wanna you know, Wingate or, you know, cause there's some power output tests that use this like just three minutes, like all out. It doesn't sound that bad on paper, but when you do it, it's absolutely freaking miserable and disgusting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, you, you look up at the clock, you're like, I gotta be, I gotta have like 30 seconds left. It's like, no, right. you're 50 seconds in. It's right. Like, oh God. <laughs> it's like, I haven't even crossed the one minute mark. Yeah. And it's like, okay, we're going to, we got to have a serious talk here. Uh, this is, this is, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm the last time I think I even did the three minute test on the rower was probably three years ago. Now we were teaching for the Kerrigan Institute. So my buddy Kenneth Jay was teaching and we we're doing lactate testing. And so we had tested everyone who was on staff already. And I was the only one who hadn't been tested yet. And I'm like, well, we don't really know if we have blood's approval to test anyone other than people who are on staff. Since if you're on staff, you're probably not going to sue us anyway. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, Oh shit. So I got to do the three minute uh, test in front of the whole class. And I had just uh, fractured and strained my rib cage like four weeks uh, before on a Ooh. snowboard incident. So that was just beyond miserable. And then when they're testing you for lactate at the end, you have to sit there with your finger out and you can't move. Like the thought of just sitting in that position at the end for another, you know, two to five minutes, just, it's just a horrible because you don't want to be in that position. Like your first thing is like to get as far away from that thing <laughs> as like possible. Yeah. 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 So, oh, that would, that would kill me. That, yeah, that would, it was that hard. Would break me <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's like the, th that's like, it's, it's the weirdest carrot to ever dangle for yourself, but that's kind of what I think about in like round three of that workout. It's like, if you Ugh. just make it through one more round, you can go puke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, and that's like how I'm negotiating with myself. Like, you just got to come on, just get 15 reps here, and then you can puke and go lay down in it. And you can roll around and you're going to feel great like this. It's like, what is wrong with me? Is <laughs> what's yeah. what's the uh, what's the worst thing that you that you've done? Would it would it be one of those wind gates? Would you say? It's a toss up. Like, I think the three minute wind gate all out is it's pretty up there. Right. Because yeah. it, especially if you're, if you're doing it in a situation that you don't want to get humiliated, right. It's one thing to do it on your own in your garage, but it's another thing to yeah. do it in front of a group or, you know, somewhere where, you know, you're going to be accountable for it. And you're really not trying to pace yourself. Uh -huh. um, and you are going to pace yourself to some degree anyway. Yeah. Um, I would say the Cajun stuff was, was pretty up there just because I don't train that way a lot, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, 
I was so not looking forward to that at all in Costa Rica. I was like, this is the dumbest idea ever. Like, I don't do this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's like it's like Everybody lifts crap. like four times yeah. the amount of weight I do, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, I was glad I did it, you know, but people are like, oh, but you didn't train for this. I'm like, no, this isn't like my highest priority. Like I did a few rounds to make sure I'm not so friggin' sore that I can't walk out of bed the next day, you know, yeah, from you just like the doms from the eccentric and the yeah. load. Outside yeah. of that, I'm like, I could have trained for a whole year for this. Hated my life for a year. I'm, I'm still going to finish in the bottom third anyway. So it's <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I'm just being realistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a different kind of thing. It's, it's stuff. It, it's, um, you know, uh, I, I, think, I think a lot of people that know me and that, that have watched what I've done over the last few years, like competitively and all of that over the last few years, 20 years uh, yeah. of training and everything. Like, wow, you, like you must have so much discipline. You have so much discipline. I'm like, not really. I mean, it's just really focused discipline. Like I, I just really care about this thing for whatever reason. I'm highly motivated. But if you're not highly motivated to do something like that, why the hell would you do that? would be like, like for me, yeah. like, I, you know, I'm going to learn how to code. Like I can tell you right now, I'm going to be the least disciplined person in that class because <laughs> like, I have zero motivation. I barely even know what that means. Like, there's no way that I'm going to actually do that. <laughs> like yeah. that would be the, so, so I, I could see like something like that. We're like, yeah, um, I'll do it just to see like how challenging it is. Like, I, I mean, I respect that you still showed up and, and, and did it. Uh, but yeah, I can definitely see why you like, like, uh, no, I got other things I <laughs> care more about doing. Yeah. But I think that's good. Even with clients and stuff too, is like, I asked them like, what is, you know, what are your main goals? Like, what are your priorities? And, you know, if there's someone like yourself where you're going to strip down to your banana hammock and walk around on stage naked, you know, that to me takes a whole another level of discipline that I a hundred percent, you know, salute. And you got to be pretty friggin' motivated to, to do that, you know, and if that's your number one thing, then cool. That's awesome. You know, other people, if they had, I do better with clients if they just admit to me that like lifting is not their main thing. You know, it's yeah. like, Hey, I want to be in good shape. You know, I want to play with my grandkids or whatever. Great. Or yeah, I want to compete in the CrossFit games or obstacle course racing or whatever, but you always have to have a realistic discussion. If you're not a professional athlete about where, where is that line? Like how far are you going to go when it starts to impact the rest of your life? Like for me, like, if I had the choice to go kiteboarding or lift, I'd go kiteboarding all the time, right? If you told me you can squat 500 or you could, you know, kiteboard and do a 40 foot jump, a 40 foot jump all day, like number yeah. one. Um, but knowing that makes everything else easier, right? So if my legs are too sore for six weeks of, you know, beating the shit out of myself on the water in South Padre and all my squat numbers go even lower than what they were before. I'm okay. That's all right. That was the thing that I signed up for. I, I did the main thing or I think yep. a lot of times it's easy to be like, no, I want to do both. Or I want to do like all three. And it's like, Ooh, now you're trying to ride two horses with one ass and that's going to be a lot harder. You might be able to make progress, but you have to have a realistic discussion about when you have to decide one or the other, what, what is the higher priority to, you know? And I think that's, something that's always changing too. And like for myself, like I, I just, I'm very intolerant of any pain associated with lifting. If like I get doms, all that stuff. I don't care about that. That doesn't matter. But like, if I start having a lot of joint pain, I, that for me is just like a, a no go where with other people, they're like, I have joint pain all the time. I don't care. If I could squat 50 more pounds and my joint pain doubles. Like, Oh, I take that all day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I've never, I've never been like that. Like I've always been like, oh, this, this sucks. Like, I, I mean, I, I don't mind pain, discomfort, but it's kind of like, right. cause to me, it's always been like when those things start to happen, that, that just means it, it, the runway is about to end. That's, right. That's, right. Like, so, so <laughs> Your it's time like, is yeah, limited. yeah, yeah. Like that, that to me is, it's, it's kind of short, short sighted in a lot of ways, but that's, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess in a way I respect that mentality, but I don't know. It's, uh, it's, probably a cost to that yeah but you just i think for me maybe it's just because i'm getting older like i as much as it pains me to say this i'm actually prioritizing being able to do the thing the rest of my life right we're 20 years ago eh, probably wasn't that concerned about it. and i got as close to like completely destroying myself from stupid ass lifting of very low weights than i ever want to get to again 
you know, and that was probably good that happened earlier instead of later. Cause I think I probably yeah. would have done some severe damage to myself long-term. Um, but the older I get, the more I'm just like, Oh, and then you get injured, right. I've blown my ankle, blown my shoulders out, all this bunch of stuff. And you realize like what it's like to not be able to just lift without pain. And you realize like how much you like really missed it. You know, I remember, you know, just limping around. I pulled both my hip flexors and my groin. I'm like walking around like a geriatric penguin, just thinking about not even squatting or deadlifting, just being able to walk without pain. And I'm yeah. like, wow, like how many days did I like totally take for granted in the past? Just because my squat or my deadlift didn't go up. <laughs> yeah. 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 I I'm lucky that I, I also got that out of the way a lot, a long time ago. I was, I was like, in my like twenties, like things were starting to like early, early twenties, like things were definitely starting to go in a bad direction. So I think, cause I had never been very strong. Like I think, uh, when I graduated high school, I think I, I bench pressed, I, I know I bench pressed 205 for nine reps. And I know that because I did 205 for nine reps for the entire, my entire senior year, uh, and never moved up. I never thought to like, maybe try a different loading scheme or you know, <laughs> different rep range or something, but, but so I was never like really super strong. Uh, I mean, that's not, I don't think that's like weak for necessarily, no. but, I, but you know, I've been lifting for seven years at that point. Right. And I had a yeah. pretty good amount of muscle, but, at, but at some point I started to get uh, like in my, like when I was 19, 20, I started to get a little bit into powerlifting and, and that's kind of when I started to get stronger, but then that's like when the wheels started to come off a little mm. bit too. And I was very fortunate to, to learn some really good stuff at that point in time. So I was able to, to kind of turn things around, but there was, there were some times like where, I mean, there was an extended period of time where I would go into to the gym on Monday and I would go to deadlift and I would get over 400 pounds and I would just blow my back out oh, and I'm like, well, that, that sucks. Okay. Well, I can't really walk for the rest of this week and I can't really pick things up, but I'll, uh, I'll try again next week. Like, so then I did it again <laughs> next It'll be week. Better. And then the other, yeah. And then, so I just did that over and over again. And it, it really did. I mean, I was very, very bummed out. It was not like borderline depression. I was not in a good spot. Um, <laughs> and it was like, it, which is, which is kind of sad. Cause it's like, man, I mean, come on, there's bigger problems in the world than that. But uh, it really did bum me out. And it made me realize like, no, I, I like this stuff way too much to do it incorrectly and to, yeah. to get myself hurt. Like, cause now, now it's like, I, I totally get that where it's like, I just want to be able to picks like stuff up off the floor. Like forget about the, 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 the dreams of deadlifting, so showing pounds that's over, you know, like, uh, which it turned out not to be, which like, which is, which is cool. But I, yeah. I, I think like, yeah, like it's, it's really, it's good. <laughs> you kind of have to go through that again, learning lessons the hard way. Uh, I, I think sometimes you have to go through those periods where uh, you realize like this, this thing really is a privilege and uh, do not take it for granted. Uh, Cause it's, it's pretty cool to be able to do this stuff that we do with our bodies. And when you, yeah, for me, when I, when I don't have that, it's like, in, like joint pain things, it's kind of just a signal. It's like, Hey, you've been here before. Yeah. Don't do this. Like, don't, like you got to reassess here because this is, this is going to take you down a, a bad road. Not, not worth it. Yeah. Do, you, <laughs> do you think when you're younger, if someone more experienced, even someone you respected came up to you and said, Hey man, I think you're going down the wrong path. You may get injured. You should go this direction. Do you, do you think you would have listened to him? I know I would love to say I would have listened to him, but I know I wouldn't have. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it depends on the context. If, I mean, if they caught me crawling before you're you know, injured after, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, before, before you're injured. No, I mean, dude, yeah. people had, I mean, plenty of people had, I remember when I was like 12 years old, I first learned how to deadlift. Like, I mean, learned how to deadlift in quotes, um, yeah, like this, this guy walked up to me in the gym and he was like, Hey, Hey man, like, I, I mean, I think I was like, I was like 12, I had like 225 in the bar and it was just like every, like the worst thing you could imagine with deadlifts, like all of the worst things. Right. And he walked up to me and he was like, Hey man, like, I don't think that's good. Like you, you should maybe try something <laughs> else. And I'm like, but I'm trying to like make my lower back bigger. Like I, and it fucking hurts. So it must be working. Right. And he was <laughs> like, he was like, you know, he tried, he tried to have me do it with like dumbbells. And he was like, Hey, why don't you try with dumbbells and keep them at your sides. And he was trying to teach me how to do like a dumbbell RDL. He was trying to teach yeah. me how to do a hip hinge and actually control my pelvis and, 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 and be able to, you know, push my pelvis back and, and, and actually get the, uh, the full hip extension <laughs> like at the top and everything and not just grind through with my back. And, um, yeah, I was like, as soon as he walked away, I put the dumbbells down and did another set of the, of the <laughs> <laughs> my deadlifts. I'm like, 
Scott doesn't know anything. Uh, so, so no, that plenty of, uh, plenty of moments like that. Uh, you, you, you see, you got to learn the hard way. A lot of times that's just, yeah. I always like better. asking trainers and other people that question because the, the consensus appears to be, if you are not injured at that point and you're young enough, almost no one will listen. And I've noticed yeah. this with, and I don't train a lot of younger clients now. I used to a little bit. And so my thought then changed from, okay, they're not going to listen to me talking them out of stupid shit. So can the car is still going to go off the road? Can I just have them put it in a snowbank and not go off the 50 foot cliff? Right. Mm -hmm. Can I have them make a mistake that they'll learn enough from, but not permanently <laughs> injure themselves? Yeah. 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 <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a interesting. Hmm. That's interesting thought. Like I have a young kid that I'm going to start working with soon. I, I, I was kind of thinking that as I was putting this program together, I mean, like, you know, I don't want this program to be too good. Like, right. <laughs> it's got to be a little bit stupid. Like there's, because there's no reason for him to have a perfect program right off the, the, no. the bat. So, so yeah, that's an interesting concept. I, I, I like that. I also remember being at the tactical strength challenge, God, probably 11 or 12 years old. And I'm standing next to my buddy, Adam glass. And we're watching a guy, you know, do a pooping dog version of a deadlift at like four fifty five, mm -hmm. And we both looked at each other and we're like, wow, did you see the angle of that lower back and that thoracic? <laughs> like he looked like a human cashew, like trying to pick up weight. <laughs> and we're both like, on one hand, that's extremely scary. I never want to see that again. And equally impressive. He just walked away without any pain from it. <laughs> it's just cool. You yeah. This yeah. is like, wow. <laughs> it's like, what was that? Did it, did it look bad? Like, <laughs> we're both impressed and horrified, like at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Totally. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like, especially when you're young, like you can definitely get away with the stuff, but it's like you said, just kind of uh, setting them up to have a place to fall, you know, when, when it does yeah. happen, it's like, let me just soften this blow a little bit when it does, when it does happen. Uh, yeah. It's like, you're, you're still going to jump out of the plane. Just for God's sake, put a parachute on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. If you change yeah. your mind halfway down, it's there, you know, you may want to use yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, if you want it, just letting you know, it's just letting choice, you know it's there, bro. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for the, the chat. I really appreciate it. Always good to, to talk with you and uh, appreciate all your training knowledge and sharing it with everybody here. Where can people find out more about you if you want to be found? Maybe you're still hiding. You don't want anyone to find you, which I totally get. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, man, thank you so much for having me on. Like you're an absolute legend in the field. And I have the utmost respect for you. And oh. uh, like you're one of the, one of the people that I've been uh, just, I feel really, uh, really grateful to have my life and you, you and Jody as well. Um, so, so thank you for, for having me on. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to find me, um, honestly, rebel performance is probably a good place to go. The, the, I think rebel performance has more content of, uh, of me than I do myself. Um, I would I'm say a that's hundred percent true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least more current. Um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, rebel performance is a good place to go. Um, if you, if you do find me on Instagram, uh, at liqueur fit, I will probably, I won't respond until either uh, Thursday or Sunday. It's the only time I check my Instagram, but there if you, you did want to contact me directly, uh, just, just cause I will tell you if you, if you, if you find me on Instagram, just email me, uh, at liqueurfit <laughs> at gmail.com. Uh, so L A C U R E F I T at gmail.com, but uh, always happy to talk shop. Awesome. And I'm, I'm training Mr. Serby now, so this would be pretty fun. I, I put him oh, through all sweet. the heinous rowing stuff we were just nice. talking about. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to hear about it. He, he's awesome. I mean, James is is the man, uh, but he'll he'll give you everything that he's got for that program for sure. So that I'm excited. Oh yeah, it goes. yeah, it was yeah. pretty fun. I was just like, well, I said we we can have you do this kind of heinous assessment. Your goal is lifting and running. So I said it's not super specific, but it's something you can retest. And if you find you know like running starts to cause little niggly issues or whatever. You know, it's a plus to be kind of interesting data to see, you know, what kind of where you're at in the spectrum and stuff. And, you know, he's super cool. He's like, yeah, man, whatever you program, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it, man. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so yeah. He's almost through most of it now. And um, yeah, he's, he's, he's done good. It's, it's been good. So it's been pretty fun. Nice. That's fun. And very last question. Uh, top two tips to do a lat pose for if you're doing a oh, lat spread. What are the two things people must keep in mind? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, one thing like people might not know is that you actually don't need to have actual lats to look like you have lats. So that's, oh, that's shit. a, so I'm in luck. Key. yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's like, there is hope. I uh, like, you, you just got to spread your arms out and, and people will think that you have lats. So that's, that's number one. Uh, but yeah, the number two thing, the, the thing that I found is like learning how to like, so most people walk around, like try at least, at least like the bros, typically the ones that are actually interested in lats, uh, they tend to just pull their shoulder blades together. Like all the time, they kind of walk around like that. So learning how to first just protract your, your scapulae and just let that kind of relax. And you do that by just you know, falling forward, just let your shoulder blades kind of come apart. I'm treating this like as an actual question, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. And then, and then, and then standing up and just trying to lengthen your torso as much as possible and just keep uh, protracting. Like you just got to like, keep, keep opening up your, your shoulder blades. That's kind of, that's kind of the key. Um, but yeah. And then uh, I guess the number two tip is just spend as much time as possible in front of the mirror, but make sure that you're not in a public place, please, because it's just embarrassing. Like, let's not do the selfies at the gym anymore. Uh, do that on your own time. Uh, it, it's, it's just, you know, it's not a good look in public. So. Awesome. Uh, a fitness friend who will remain nameless. Uh, one time Jody was out when we were first, God, I don't even know if we were engaged at that point. <laughs> she comes up to me and she's like, Oh, he seems really nice. Did he sunburn his armpits? Because <laughs> he was, you know, had the you know, kind of the lat <laughs> spread going on. That? That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> so later we're like, oh, uh, sunburn armpits. <laughs> it's like burn pits. What? Uh, what I, mean? <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, cool, man. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and my little interlude there about being stranded in Costa Rica. Much worse places to be, I know, and I'll be able to get a lot of work done and it'll be okay anyway. So I apologize to all those people who went to the Neurosports Conference uh, as you're listening to this this past weekend that I was not able to do my presentation there. Uh, They set everything up to do it live this year, which I think is amazing and a much better way to go. Um, so they were not able to do any uh, virtual talk. So I was not able to submit a talk there. So bummed that I missed it. Hopefully I'm planning to be there next year. They were super nice and gave me an invite to present there next year. If you went, let me know how it went. Uh, sounded like it was amazing. So thank you for everyone listening to the show. Really appreciate it. Any feedback on this episode with my buddy Ryan, uh, please post it up. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, share it around, leave us a review. That helps us get other guests on the show and just keeps everything going. As always, this is brought to you by the Flexidiet Certification. If you want eight interventions to help you master nutrition and recovery for yourself and also for your clients in a complete done-for-you yet flexible system, Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. That'll put you on the wait list for the next time that it opens. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Talk to you all next week where I've got a great interview uh, with my other friend, uh, Dr. Lisa, all on the aspects of psychology and mental fitness. So stay tuned for that. Talk to you then.